Welcome to Coding's Cast, the ultimate podcast dedicated to the science, art, and innovation of roof coatings. It's time to roll up our sleeves, put on our lab coats, and dive headfirst into the world of liquid protection that keeps your roofs in prime condition. The future of roofing is here and it's liquid, so don't miss out. This is Coding's Cast, where every drop counts in the world of roof protection. Hello, and welcome to another Coding Cast from Coding's Coffee Shop. My name is Heidi Ellsworth, and you know what? We've got a really special Coding's Cast today. We are with the experts from Axo Noble, and we're going to talk about sustainability, one of my favorite topics. We have experts in the house this morning that um, we're going to have just like a great conversation. So I am super excited to introduce Amanda Patterline and Tessa Slackdirt to the show. Hello, ladies. Hi. Hey, thanks, welcome. Heidi. It is so fun to have you both on here. Um, you know what? Before we dive into sustainability, let's do some introductions. So um, let's start out with Tessa. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do with Axo Noble. Um, that would be great. Yes, of course. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having us today. So yes. I'm Tessa Slachter. I'm based out of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, where our Axo Noble headquarters is. I hold a master's degree in innovation management with a specialization on sustainability. And I started my career first in the chemical industry, focusing on plastic, then moved towards recycled plastic, and now working more than five years at Oxnobel, where I'm leading the sustainable innovation function. And Tessa, it's so nice to meet you. Very impressive. And I have to tell you, Amsterdam is on my bucket list. So <laughs> someday, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Come over and see you. Amanda, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Um, I'm Amanda Patterline. I have a background in chemistry. I spent the first several years of my career as a uh, chemist in the automotive coatings field before moving into sales. Um, took a brief departure and went into a software as a service product roles, uh, which was a great experience, but found that I'm really passionate about performance coatings. Um, it excites me how aesthetics and protective properties can be used to delight our customers. So about eight months ago, I came came back into the coatings world, joined Axon Nobel, um, and have just really enjoyed seeing how our company is cultivating a resilient future with our innovations and commitment towards progress as it pertains to sustainability. Um, so I look forward to sharing today with you guys how how we're doing that while maintaining key performance and aesthetic properties. I love it. Again, so impressive. This is a great conversation. Um, Amanda, can you tell us just a little bit about Axo Nobel, um, just the company and overall, um, and what you're doing within the construction? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Axon Nobel is a global company. Um, we have a footprint um, here in the U.S. Like Tessa mentioned, we have our, our headquarters in the Netherlands. And then in the Americas region, we have research and development sites and manufacturing sites in Columbus, Ohio, Strongsville, Ohio, where I'm based, um, Garcia, Mexico, and then down in South America. Um, so a little bit about what we're doing for sustainability, which I think Tessa can probably dive a bit deeper into. Um, but we have been, we were one of the first coatings companies to set science-based targets for our ambitions. Um, I don't know, Tessa, if you want to share a little bit more about what that means to AXO and what that means for our customers. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, at Axel now we have a key, three key focus areas being climate change, circularity and health and well-being. And for climate change, we were indeed the first painting coatings company to set science-based targets that have been approved by the Science-Based Target Initiative. That means that we're looking for our own operations to reduce our carbon footprint by 15% in 2030, using 2018 as our baseline. But not just for our own operations, we've also set that target for our entire value chain. So that means that we're looking both upstream, so what can we do with our raw materials, but also downstream. So for example, how are our coatings being processed at our customers? What embodied carbon is in the products that we're supplying to our customers? And also in terms of POC, how can we reduce the POC in our product? So we're really doing upstream and downstream it's important that we have that, those very ambitious it's targets it's in line with the Paris Agreement, uh, which actually for me, this is one of the most exciting topics uh, that we're working on at Axel Nobel together with our customers and suppliers. I love it. I love it. That's, so Tessa, 
let's just talk about overall. I would love your opinion on overall sustainability, kind of what you see happening overall, and especially in metal construction. What, um, besides what your companies do leading that way, what are you seeing um, the industry kind of leading that direction, or is there a lot more work that we need to get done? So I think sustainability has been taking a huge step forward. And when I started my career, it was really a, like a niche environment. And now you see that all of the uh, students at university are learning about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and they're all being raised with that. And we see that at Oxnabel also, like, all the people want to start learning more about it. So we've actually, we've launched some internal training about carbon footprint, for example, and only in two weeks, we already have like 200 of our marketeers being trained on the topic of sustainability because they want to learn more about it. So I think that the one thing that you see is that the appetite is growing. I think also yeah. there's a lot of collaboration ongoing also in the metal construction industry. So we get with our customers and put suppliers that everybody knows that you need to work together because you cannot do this alone. And it's a great topic to also become more partners with your customers. Um, I, you know, I yeah. love hearing oh. that too, because when you're talking about the next generation, I mean, I'm a little from a, a little bit older generation than you all, but I remember, you know, those were the things that we learned, recycling, all that. And so we now are taking this to a whole new level of sustainability. Amanda, what are you seeing? Same thing kind of in the U.S. with this movement. Yeah. Um, so kind of what you were starting to talk about a bit, just from a social aspect, uh, we're seeing that consumer buying behavior change where customers are seeking more environmentally conscious solutions. So with that in mind, not just our customers, but our customers' customers are the end user. Um, we're trying to support and educate them on really the entire value chain and how they can source more sustainable solutions throughout and use that as almost like a, a selling tool to their customers who now care more about um buying environmentally conscious products. Um, and we particularly are supporting our customers and how that can be achieved when selecting metal roofing. Uh, Tessa talked a bit about kind of the different aspects of sustainability. When we're kind of watching rest of world what's happening, we're seeing some of our customers or those global customers, those in the steel manufacturing industry, looking for different ways to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, so some customers are investing in electric ovens or changing their steel manufacturing processes to achieve that. So really, we can leverage that entire value chain as we support guiding our customers towards um, highlighting their sustainable options for end users. Um, additionally, we look at, you know, regulations around MOCs, materials of concern. So there's often buzz around PFAS, uh, which go into PVDF. So when available, if there are um, less carbon intensive materials that can be used in the building products uh, process, we can guide customers on the appropriate material selection for their projects. And I think that's so a important. great point, right? Which is what you were saying is that sometimes you're moving for from one product to another because of, for example, a, a material concern. But then often it also has an impact on the power of footprint. And I think that PFAS example uh, is a great one because there you see that you're moving for one reason, but you're also reducing the carbon footprint of your materials. Mm -hmm. So, it, and it makes sense. Yeah. And, and and don't you think it's, it's education that really understanding yeah. a lot of times, you know, in the past, I, at least this is how I feel in the U.S., that um, we spent more time fighting those re regulations instead of kind of looking for solutions that mm -hmm. helped it. Mm -hmm. And it feels like that has switched. And that's kind of exciting yeah. to be watching. Yeah. I have seen more, especially recently, more customers being vocal with sustainable campaigns or um, m making announcements that really commit to their uh, emissions reductions by 2050, putting putting out their, their sustainability ambitions to the market. And I think that's really important because it's showing we're starting to embrace this change and not maybe fight or resist it, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a, that in itself is a change. Um, so, Tessa, kind of going back to you, when we're looking at 
specifically, and you've already, Amanda, you kind of touched on this, but when you're looking at coil coding suppliers, you know, really looking at making a difference, making a contribution towards reducing energy consumption and achieving circularity um, in the built environment. I know that's a lot of words there, but that, you know, so I, I think, you know, just to put it out there, I think there's probably a lot of folks out in the construction world who are kind of like, it's a coating that goes on metal. How can it make that big of a difference? But it makes a huge difference. So talk a little bit about that, the contributions that you see um, being able to make on energy and also on just that whole um, circle of life, I guess, cradle yeah. to grave. Yeah. So I think... Um if I, if I was straight up, I need two points. Because the first one is that really on like, what do we do with, the, with regard to carbon reduction and what are we, as well as our uh, fellow industry players, doing? Because I think if we look at, you know, let's go one, two, and three concept, where let's go one and two is our operations, uh, let's go two is actually off the electricity that we buy for our own operations, and then scope three is our entire value chain, so upstream and downstream. Our customers scope one and two is actually then our scope three, while our scope one and two is there. So you already see that sort of like how that connects. And what we see is that the first yeah. steps that we all need to take is to start sharing more data. So we at the moment do have the product carbon footprint data for all the materials that we supply. Because you want to make sure that you first have that transparency and you, you can know sort of where to focus on. That's then the second thing that we do is to look at four different areas. So we look at what can we do with regards to energy transition to help we move towards, for example, electricity and then to green electricity. So in the whole industry, you can then, of course, think of e-beam and what type of coatings are needed to get uh, to, well, to start using e-beam solutions. The second area is more fossil efficiency. So how to make sure that we're doing more with less, uh, so reducing the amount of layers or like, increasing the efficiency. The third area is more on reduction of solvents and solvent capturing in the process. And the last one more on circular solutions. So what type of bio-based materials are available, post-consumer recycled materials are available. And then, of course, again, Good. sharing all of that data. So also with our customers understand that how much energy is being used at our customers. So that will be like all for carbon reduction and how we are collaborating on that. I think... The other part of your question was more on like, how does this then relate also to green buildings and like to the build industry? Because that's where in the end, coatings also end up. And what we see is that more and more green buildings are being built. So green buildings, like in the definition of the World's Green Building Council, uh, are buildings that can create positive impacts on the climate and environment uh, in the design and in the use of that building. Um, and we know that buildings are responsible for 39% of the carbon emissions of the world. So it's huge, at 39 percent, uh, and we can help to make those buildings greener, and not just by painting them green, but actually by making them better buildings. <laughs> so um, what we can do is we can help our customers and the customers of our customers to get points in green building certifications. So I think you've heard of uh, LEED certifications or GREEM certifications as well. Yep. But designers can get and architects and building owners can get points in those certification schemes and we can help to get those points for example by sharing data on the environmental footprint of the planet but also on heat reduction so heat island reduction which our coatings can help with that's like amanda yeah i think there there's a lot to um unpack in in all that Tessa shared. Um, so some, I guess, immediate or practical applications and thoughts. So one, obviously, when you're looking at metal roofing, inherently there's an element of circularity there with being able to recycle the materials and the longevity that's offered um, within that product will bolster support of a sustainable solution. Um, for certain regions in the U.S., depending on um, the climate, you really want to take a look at your what's fit for purpose for the project. So um, PVD, PVDF level performance along the coast, ec excellent example, that makes sense. But Midwest US, if you can source something like an SMP type coding to achieve um, still excellent performance, but using a less carbon intensive material, um, that's something we often try to help guide our customers on understanding, you know, what codings would be adequate for the project itself while identifying maybe the best sustainable solution 
readily available. Um, I touched a bit on MOCs. There are products like chrome-free primers available. The rest of the world has adopted um, chrome-free primers very successfully. Not yet taken off in the U.S., um, but that is something that if we aim to move away from materials of concern, that is a product that could be fit for for projects. Um, there's also opportunities to look at ways to leverage digital tools, either in optimizing your production line or further downstream with a uh, point of installation. There's tools that can optimize your waste your waste fracture to, to cut waste and reduce materials that you're um, you know, scrapping at end of project, which of course then lends itself well to economical advantages too, um, while being a bit more conscious of uh, sustainability efforts. Yeah. You know what? That is the, that's the balance, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> economics and environmental. And, but it seems to be getting closer yeah. that, that mm -hmm. people are putting a value to, um, especially what we started out talking about that next generation, um, or really have a value to environmental and doing the right things. And I just want to go back real quick to Tessa, you said something that I thought was just great. And that was that you are sharing data that you are being transparent about what's in the product and helping, you know, down the line to the coders and then obviously the contractors, the general contractors who maybe have to be putting EPDs together, you know, they now have the information that you all have. And I think that's kind of maybe not new, but definitely a lot more than it used to be. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And I feel, you know, that is really the, the starting point because you need to start sharing the data. And we are also looking at our suppliers. How could we get better data out of our suppliers, not just using industry data and right. values, but their actual data? And then also for our customers, like, what is this? Yeah, the, how much energy do they really use? And I think what you said was interesting. Like, there is a bit of trade-off between economic and environment. And what I see is that more and more it's not a trade-off. It's actually going hand-in-hand. Also, with part yeah. of you know, the price of carbon that's well, starting to be priced, especially in the metal industry, I think you see some very interesting movements um, where then really making the environmental conscious choice is also the logical choice from an, uh, from an economic perspective. Yeah. And that's taken a long time to get there. But, you know, when we talk about sharing data, I want to talk about the white paper that you just had, that you just came out with the role of coil coatings in building a sustainable environment. You're really putting it out there to talk about navigating and how this landscape, like we're just talking here, is changing. Why don't you start out with kind of talking a little bit about that white paper? Um, so I think, you know, as I've kind of been t discussing either materials of concern or considering, you know, those less carbon intensive materials when sourcing um, or build specifying your project really. Um, but then also there's other ways that a company can sort of set itself up for success. I think AXO has had a like really a great approach with identifying and implementing a sustainability team. Obviously, I lean heavily on Tessa as a sustainability expert, and she's um, objective in her approach and our conversations. So that has really helped, I think, us set our sights on sustainable ambitions while keeping our customers at the forefront of our focus. I provide the customer perspective. Tessa can weigh in from sustainable from the sustainable perspective so that we can um, create something or create an approach that works well for the business. Um, if we look at what Tessa has talked about with the scope one through three ambitions, leveraging and partnering with suppliers. So she mentioned how we lean on our raw material suppliers for data. We would expect and want our customers to lean on us for environmental data. Um, we're looking at how EPDs can support their efforts in um, pursuit of sustainable ambitions. Um, further, further down the road towards end products, um, you can consider the environmental impact from either using renewable energy to, to manufacture and then also looking at reducing the urban heat island effect. Uh, using cool coatings can help reduce that effect 
as well as drive down the demand for energy to cool the buildings. Um, CRRC maintains a publicly available database. You can uh, check that out or reach out to us to, to get the cool roof rating council's um, third party ratings of coatings to see what would help in your efforts to reduce that heat island effect. I was just reading actually about this in Coatings Tech there are standards that will allow for small compliance credits that are available even like in climate zones one and above, which would constitute US. Um, you know, if you're using exterior building materials that meet certain criteria for uh, reducing that effect, reducing the demand on energy, I think Tessa might be able to weigh in a little bit more on those different certifications and efforts too. Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, thinking those green buildings regularly said is that we can help those customers to get those points indeed with the environmental footprint data, with uh, data on the heat island reduction effects. So I think it's really, again, as you as you were also saying, Heidi, it's really key to start collaborating, opening up and sharing all of that data. And I think looking back also at that white paper, uh, it's really about what, what we're trying to convey is how we can help to navigate that environment. And sustainability, I think, is one of the most complex environments because it consists of so many different sectors that if you start diving into sustainability, you may feel overwhelmed. You don't really know where to look. Uh, well, that's one of the things that we really want to help our customers with as well, where to look. And therefore, we have those three focus areas that at least also help us to give a bit more direction so that area of health and well-being, uh, sorry, health and safety. So the, the three areas of health and safety, circularity, and climate change. Because when you look at those three focus areas, it already helps you to get a bit better direction of where to look at. You know, that I, I, just, I love this. And I love how much you're focused on your customers and helping them. And so one of the things, I, and I just, as you're talking about this, to use that white paper, this kind of will help not just your customers, but the industry overall start to really look and see and think about the, like you said, those three areas, but also how every product makes a difference. Every, every, every type of product throughout the whole built environment is going to make a difference. And you're really being able to put that out there. So where do you see, and Amanda, I would love your thoughts on where do you see the greatest opportunity um, right now for coil coatings, but for the metal um, construction industry overall to, you know, really make that difference that improves sustainability? Um, in the U.S., we deal with government regulations. We deal with a lot of, um, a lot of different things, um, that sometimes get in the way of that net zero with your goal mm -hmm. of 2050. So what are some of your thoughts on where, where, what are some of the maybe low hanging fruit or the best opportunities right now? Yeah, I think some of the more immediate ideas that we've touched on a bit, um, looking at fit for purpose for projects. So, uh, when possible using, less carbon intensive materials, um, depending on region. Also, you know, as I mentioned, lever leveraging recycled materials, Tessa mentioned looking at bio-based materials, if we can implement that in coatings, of course, without sacrificing performance, because obviously you don't want to be changing over materials and, and roofing and having to reside things every 15 years when right now we have the longevity um, of these superior performance products. Also, looking, looking at different at dig digital tools to drive down waste from manufacturing points. So there's different color tools and QC tools to optimize your process um, as a coil coder or us as a coil manufacturer um, to lean out the waste in that process. Even at the end point, like I mentioned, for installation, um, fine tuning your estimating and quoting process that then drives out your bill of materials and ordering. Um, if you can cut down on that waste, and again, that's a great opportunity for cost savings for a company. If we look a bit more longer term, obviously we'll be longer term more investment needed, but looking into new technologies to drive down energy consumption in the manufacturing process. We already see that a lot, especially in rest of world where steel manufacturers are making significant investments either because they have to, because of environmental regulations, or 
because they're seeing, you know, this is the, the right thing to do and to make changes. Um, but, you know, investing in different ovens and technology to drive down their, their footprint from the start of manufacture. If you look at that specifically with coatings, there's ideas like e-bean cure technology, which is going to be a more efficient, a more energy efficient cure and faster. So speeding the line time. Um, so those are kind of a range of opportunities customers can take advantage of. And kind of why I mentioned that sustainability team is a great way to stay on top of it because you can be looking at low hanging fruit while also considering and planning for future larger investments that might be and needed. I, I love that. Plus, no, no, go ahead, Tessa. I, I took that side because what Amanda was saying, like for example, on eBay, what we did is when we started looking at that scope one, two, and three, and there's that value chain impact, we see that in the metal industry, like in the oil coating, 50% of, energy of the end carbon footprint in the value chain comes from curing of the coatings. So that's also really an area of value that to focus on, for example, through e because with e we know that we would be able to reduce the energy consumption by 75% and move towards renewable electricity. So that's actually a win-win-win, and they also have those efficiencies in terms of production. Uh, so that seems to be really you know, the way forward when we, when we look at metal closing. Yeah, and the fact that you're breaking it down, you're you're breaking it down and figuring out where and how. And I love too. I've been you know in the roofing industry for a long time and worked with manufacturers, but I love the fact of looking long term. Like what Amanda said is you know take care of things today, but long-term. And to me, that's just good business because you know, it's things are, <laughs> things are changing. Those are going to be requirements. So why not work on them now so that you're ahead of the game before it's regulated? Um, mm -hmm. Because we, I, I mean, I hate to tell everybody, but you know, it's going to be. So, um, okay. One of the things um, I would love to hear too is speaking of long-term is what you all are working on, um, innovation advancements that you can tell us, um, that especially come around, you know, the coatings and we would talk about PVDF. And so maybe Amanda, you can start us out with some of the things that you're seeing for the future to help sustainability efforts. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a bit of a, a balancing act. We recognize, um, coatings made with PVDF really deliver the benchmark and performance. Um, so when we're thinking about this, there's kind of two aspects to innovating for sustainable coating solutions. There's the materials of concern, MOCs, um, but there's also the efforts to decarbonize lines. So we don't have to limit ourselves to replacing PVDF today, we can look at highest volume. Is there a big opportunity to decarbonize um, with, uh, you know, the the faster energy curing e-beam type technology um, and maybe starting there, that would be less energy consumption. As you look at iterating on and, and finding alternatives to PVDF, then that MOC factor would come into play. Um, additionally, with some of these different technologies, you're looking at higher solids. Um, so again, further reduction of VOCs, um, you know, being a, a global company, we can take advantage of a lot of those activities happening around the world and bring it into region, bring it into our region. Uh, we recently partnered with Wuxi Elpont, um, who has a lot of experience in high and medium energy systems for different plastic type applications. So we're looking at how we can leverage their expertise for low energy systems for coil coatings. Um, we have a you know, as we look at this transition, we have a team on board that could help customers because it will take some investment. Um, I think that it's going to take some time to bring this to market to meet requirements for performance. A lot of the the baseline building blocks of our coatings have been in the market for a long time. We've built a lot of trust into those technologies and we want to yeah. really limit the risk um, so that we can, you know, us, our customers can control the price well, control the margins well. So we hold a lot of weight in assessing the performance um, first impact to environment. So as we pursue ad adequate data, um, you know, to, to bolster that trust, it could look like as this comes to reality, there's a transition of hybrid systems, maybe standard cure with e-beam. Um, but we, 
we do see that this will be important in probably the next five years. So we're taking the steps to invest in resources and equipment and work with our partners to bring it to market to market and probably something that we'll have to, you know, recommend people continue to watch because it, it yeah. will come to fruition. I love it. I love it. And it will be on Coding's Coffee Shop so they can watch. Yes. <laughs> they can see. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, okay. Uh, one of the things that I've seen in your material and that you've talked about is the first time, or I'm sorry, right first time approach, right? Mm -hmm. So doing it right the first time. Um, Tessa, Talk a little bit about that and how that philosophy kind of mission um, upstream, downstream with you guys, how yeah. that's working. So um, in this second, we believe that, that upstream and the downstream one, right? the downstream part, we really want to make sure when we launch something to our customers, that they can be confident that we are launching the right things. So that they know what type of settings they have to change on our machines so that they know what they can expect. So therefore, we are doing a lot of testing in our own facilities, like, for example, in our labs in the U.S. as well. Um, when we are launching it, we're very closely working with our customers and already have information on like, how long do we expect this material to last, because it's all indeed like, about the quality and sustainability, because we believe that they go hand in hand and we should not sacrifice quality because of sustainability. Um, because then actually it's not a sustainable right. product. So that's really what we as Axonwell very much believe in. So at our customers, we're looking at like, what can we do with the curing processes, what can we do with those reduction of VOCs, and what can we do with uh, yes. less carbon, well, embodied carbon in the materials that we are supplying. And with our suppliers, we're looking at what, what plans it actually have. So when we are getting the actual results from our suppliers, also sitting with them, and what plans do you have until 2030? Because it may be that today we are buying from a supplier who has a bit higher carbon footprint that they're actually investing in a hydrogen plant. So that would not be a good choice for us to then move to another supplier and then afterwards move back. So it's really about sharing all the information as well. So that the choice that you're making is the right choice and not that you need to make change after change, but really do it in our semi. It goes all back to that communication. Amanda. Yeah, and I think, um, again, like you, you had asked Heidi a bit about low-hanging fruit. So while a lot of times the focus on um, optimizing coil coders lines has an has a cost advantage, um, you can really look at that from a s sustainability and waste reduction advantage as well. So if we if we can have our tech service team support in any way optimizing coil coders lines and conditions to reduce variation there's always best practices that could be implemented around monitoring ovens as they stand today for performance you know using a data pack to ensure you're getting proper cure training tech training your techs and coil coder operators for any continuous improvement in QC uh, efforts to help reduce that variation. On our end at AXO, we we monitor our quality and, and line performance to ensure that right for the first time in consistency by using historical data and analytics, uh, we can determine some color trends online and make recommendations to drive drive towards right first time off the line. Um, additionally, coil coders can look at how to reduce switch outs online, so less color switch outs. Our, our um, Ceramistar Select palette helps support that yeah. um, because, you know, you're driving up volumes, less paint waste, uh, less right. line downtime. And again, positives on the sustainability side as well as cost reduction. There's also employing the use of ADUs, automatic um, dispensing units for on-demand better control of inventory as well as control of batch sizes. Um, Midterm on our end, looking at, I mentioned, you know, some continuous improvement projects. So using gauge r and &R studies for better test methods, more accurate, precise test methods on the QC front will then lend itself to better um products at the end, you know what I mean? So we could look at different methods for measuring DFT or film thickness um, that again drive better accuracy of our test methods and in turn better end products. And then um, I've talked a lot about digital tools at a high level, but again, some of those cloud-based color tools could be used for improved color precision 
Um, so we're trying to drive, I guess, better accuracy and some quality control metrics um, on our end that can then carry through over to the coil coders line. Yeah. Uh, if we look at kind of those end users, uh, there's there's a lot of I really love to, this is the, my two worlds coming together, like software as a service and paint, but there's a lot of software as a service tools out there that contractors can use to help with reducing waste on their end and leading out process. Um, and of course, appropriate safety and installation training for those users um, will support their efforts too. Yeah. I I have to tell you both, I'm so impressed. I'm just like, I'm really, really impressed. Um, and I think, you know, Amanda, you were kind of going there, and I love this, is that let's bring it down because – Right now, we have an, uh, contractors across the country and uh, across the globe who are listening to this coding's cast and are kind of like thinking, okay, how does this apply to me? But I think you have said that so eloquently throughout is, you know, looking at your coatings, looking at your suppliers, um, whether it's the coatings, the coil, whether it's the uh, metal roofing, metal siding, architectural metal, whatever it may be, and then looking at how it's produced, how it's put together, all of the components, and then what it can offer for you in your business. Is it have bright colors, you know, white colors where it's reflective, so it's helping bring down the heat island. Um, I, you know, I'm just kind of recapping all of those kind of things. Really makes a difference to you all as contractors that you then can communicate this to your building owners or to your homeowners, um, understanding the chain, the production and what, what all came through it. So, so cool. I love it. Um, so, okay. How can contractors get more information? I mean, I know there's a lot of general contractors. There's a lot of, um, large roofing contractors and um, building envelope contractors who are putting EPDs together, who are have to submit that, you know, whether it's to architects, consultants, or their building owners, um, or, you know, due to regulations. Um, where can they get more information for that? And also, where can they download the new white paper? Um, yeah, yeah, thanks for asking. So a couple of avenues. Um, Happy for people to reach out to us. You can go to Axon Nobel's U.S. Coil Coatings website, and there's a contact us form, or um, you know, reach out to me, Amanda Patterline. Also, to download the white paper, um, that is on our U.S. Coil Coatings website under News Sustainability White Paper. Um, there's also, also a link because we'd love to hear from the market. Uh, there's a link for a survey to get feedback on your company's sustainability ambitions and views, um, so that we can continue to, you know, really align with with the goals of the market and provide the best solutions for your needs. That is excellent. Well, ladies, thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here this morning and for sharing all this great knowledge. Um, I know I learned a lot today. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Good thank you, Heidi. Yeah, we enjoyed the enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tessa, for um, coming from all the way from Amsterdam to be on this call. And Amanda, I look forward to us meeting at a future show. I do too. Yes, I really I do too. That would be great. <laughs> this will be great. So thank you, ladies. And thank you all for listening. Be sure to go to the AXO Nobel directory on both Coatings Coffee Shop and Roofers Coffee Shop. You can find all the information there. You can find the website. You can find the white paper. You can get information that you need for your business to become more sustainable, which is what we're all looking for for the future. So also be sure to check out all of our Coatings Cast on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe subscribe and ring that bell. And on your favorite podcast channel, be sure to subscribe and set your notifications. And of course, anytime you can find it on Coatings Coffee Shop under the RLW navigation, just look for Coatings Cast. We will be seeing you next time on Coatings Cast. Thanks for joining us on this coding adventure. Stay tuned for more episodes. And in the meantime, be sure to follow us on all social media to stay up to date with all things roof coatings. Until next time, stay coded. For more information, go to codingscoffeeshop.com.